First of all, a very good morning to everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be back in Ireland. Um, I've been asked to speak about um, Scotland's leadership role in climate change. And I think I thought I'd start by just saying, here's a picture of my, my home city, Edinburgh. Um, I would challenge anybody here to go to Edinburgh and see very much difference going into Edinburgh as you do going into, say, Dublin. In other words, the leadership position that Scotland has had in climate change is not because of some whiz-bang, bling stuff that you see around. A lot of it is to do with political leadership. A lot of it is to do with things that are hidden, like efforts to improve energy efficiency in buildings, uh, efforts to change the electricity system. And I'll talk a little bit about that over the next 10 or 15 minutes. But as a result of all of that, what we've actually seen over the last 15 years ago uh, or so is Scotland has actually reduced its emissions. It set very challenging targets back in 2009. It, it said we will aim for delivering 42% emission reductions by 2020, 80% by 2050. And actually, it's already just about hit its 42% target five years early. It's also set some very challenging energy targets. So it, it has been bumping up its renewable electricity targets. And the current one is to say we want to be producing 100% of what we consume by renewables by 2020. We're currently at about 60%. Now, 15 years ago, it was about 10% of our electricity was from renewables. So it's being ramped up very quickly. But it's worth just bearing in mind what that, these bigger targets mean. And in fact, the government is currently consulting on, on actually reducing that 80% to a 90% target by 2050. To get to that point, you cannot be driving diesel and petrol cars. You cannot be heating your homes with natural gas, which is currently about 80% of the homes in Scotland use natural gas. So what we're talking about is a fundamental shift in the way in which we produce and use energy and use land across Scotland. And that's essentially the, the plans that are laid out over the next 10 or 20 years. So why did Scotland take on this target? Uh, what were the benefits? Um, I think it's worth starting to make the point that Scotland is part of the UK. And so a lot of the powers on energy actually are reserved to the Westminster Parliament, to the UK Parliament. Scotland can only do certain things. They can promote renewables. In Scotland, we can promote energy efficiency. We can use the planning system to decide whether to have big power stations or not. But actually, that's about it. And in the UK context, this, what's called the trilemma, has been, has been uh, basically the, the sort of cornerstone of energy policy for the last 20 years or so. We want to secure supply of energy, we're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to manage climate change, and we want to keep it all affordable. But the difference in Scotland, ever since Scotland got its devolved powers, was actually that there were three other things that mattered. One of which was Scotland, rather like Ireland, is windy and wet. Therefore, actually the opportunity for energy generation from hydropower, from wind power, and others, is hugely important. So actually, Scotland saw this not as a, a problem to go to renewables, but as an economic opportunity. And that's been the thread that has gone through right from the start, is how do we build up a sector which is going to bring lots of inward investment, lots of jobs, lots of support to areas of the country that don't normally get this type of economic opportunity. So there's been a huge push on the economic opportunity. There's actually increasingly, in recent years, been an increasing focus on the social benefits that come as well. And that's from actually, rather than having big companies coming in and drop turbines into the landscape, saying, how do we get local communities to take a stake in the energy system? Now, local communities might be farmers, they might be local community groups, they may be local authorities. So local energy opportunities where they take an, uh, an equity stake, an ownership stake in the, in, the, in the energy system. Because if they take an ownership stake, they start to see income coming back from owning the energy. And so you start to see local social benefits because the income can then be used to insulate homes, build new village halls, 
create community benefits. So you start to see lots of additional co-benefits, social benefits, from this push towards renewables. And the third part is the political return. As a new country in terms of the devolved powers, all of the Scottish leaders have enjoyed realising that actually Scotland could be at the forefront of what is one of the great international challenges for the 21st century. You know, how do you deliver sustainable development? How do you have a thriving economy, a thriving social enterprise, but also meet environmental goals? So there's been a big push on the political benefits of Scotland being a leadership position. So there's been all these extra factors which have driven this type of energy revolution. And just to give you some numbers, um, just over the last 10 years, you know, the, the capacity, the amount of renewables that have been installed has risen from just over uh, 3 gigawatts, 3,000 megawatts, up to 8.5, it's almost up to 9. So it's almost tripled over 10 years. So a huge inward investment to support this. And what we've seen is this growth in renewables. So the blue, light, the blue bars basically are the total amount of uh, electricity consumed in Scotland, and the grey at the bottom is how much of that is being produced by renewables. So it's gone from 10 years ago about 20% up now. In fact, that's 2015. If you go up to current day, it's about 60, a bit over 60%. So we're seeing very, very rapid changes. Now, in the early days... That was driven by subsidies. That was driven by essentially consumers, electricity and gas consumers across the whole of the UK paying subsidies for renewables and Scotland grabbing as many of those subsidies as possible. But we're now in a position in 2017 where offshore wind has just cleared in an auction at about £57 a megawatt hour. Onshore wind is cheaper than that. Those are as cheap as any fossil fuel price. In other words, you don't have to subsidise these things anymore. We're at a point where you can just do renewables in a cost-competitive way going forward in Scotland. The other thing that's being pushed very hard is to, is to note that what we're seeing is a blurring between electricity and other forms of energy, heating and transport. And I was lucky enough just to catch the end of the, the conversation you had before the coffee break. <coughs> Some of the stuff that we're doing in Scotland is about saying if we know we have lots of surplus wind and we can't sell the electricity because the grid can't take any more, why aren't we using that surplus wind power to power vehicles or to create hydrogen to use in ferries or buses? So what we're seeing is a whole growth of testing new local energy systems from hydrogen systems up in Orkney uh, some sort of what they call load shedding, some interesting stuff going on in Shetland, through to multiple off-grid, off-local systems for trying to maximise the value of the energy that we have in a way that supports reduced heat costs for people, reduced transport costs for people. And this is particularly the issue for some of the remoter islands, so about 90 islands around Scotland are inhabited. The import costs of bringing diesel into these places is very costly. Actually, they often have lots of indigenous energy. Why not use that to actually deliver low-cost transport links around the, around the island? So there's a lot of really interesting, innovative things going on in these spaces. The other thing that's happening a lot, as I said, is this engagement with communities. So there's been a huge push to actually engage much more effectively with local communities in terms of not just giving them a, a little bit of money from the wind farm, um, but actually saying how do they take a leadership position so that they use the energy infrastructure as the thing around which you build jobs, you build investment into the community. So there's a huge amount of work in terms of engaging communities, local groups, uh, both in urban areas as well as rural areas. So what's the outcome of all this work over the last 15 years? Well, the answer is what we've seen is a very rapid reduction in a couple of things, one of which is these little purple line, which is waste. We've done a lot on reducing waste, landfill, capturing landfill gases and things like that. But the other big one has been the energy sector, the power sector, where we've reduced emissions. And in fact, if we carried on beyond 2015, our last coal power fire station closed last year. 
the big Longanet plant. So now the whole electricity system in Scotland is just renewables and two old nuclear power stations which will close in the next 10 years, plus one little small balancing gas fire power station. Where we have not been so successful has been on transport, this blue thing, and agriculture. And these are ones that have been, have, have, um, the government and local authorities have found much, much harder for some of the reasons that you were discussing just before the coffee break. But what we are seeing on transport is that we are moving into what we would think of as a, uh, something of a cusp of change at the moment. And that's being driven by two or three things. One of which is the focus increasing, and this isn't a Scottish city, but uh, one of these is, is, uh, is air pollution in cities and the drive to actually reduce air pollution in cities. One is about the congestion and how we deliver more effective transport services. And the other is the, the things that are happening with modern IT technology. Because in increasingly we are seeing this move to how do you do end-to-end -end transport services. So it matters less about whether you own the vehicle and more about whether you get from A to B effectively and how you do it in a clean way if you're going into cities, i.e. with electric vehicles or with hydrogen vehicles. So we're starting to see some really interesting things happening in the UK more broadly. So for example, uh, one of the energy companies, Ovo, has just done a deal with the Nissan Leaf so that if you buy the new Nissan Leaf from January, you essentially will get all of your power to power that car for free. But the quid pro quo is that the power company will nab some of your electricity and your battery when they need it. In other words, you're blurring the boundary between an electricity system and a transport system. But those are the sorts of things that we're starting to see. And Nicola Sturgeon, in her recent program for government address, also announced that in Scotland we're going to try and uh, stop the, sa the sale of new petrol and diesel cars from 2032. So in other words, in 15 years, we need to have created the enabling infrastructure with electric vehicles or hydrogen vehicles so that we don't need any petrol or diesel cars onto the market in 15 years' time. So we're starting to see some very rapid changes. On agriculture, this is the other area we've had real challenges, and I know you're going to be talking about that this afternoon. Um, we, there are two parts to the agricultural side, or the land use side. We have increasing amounts of forestry being planted. So in fact, we've got a target of, uh, originally it was 10,000, it's now 15,000 hectares a year of new forestry every year for the next few years. So there's a very strong push to reforest parts of Scotland. And that's driving quite a lot of behaviours. And there's a thriving timber product industry off the back of that. So that's going very well. So the whole work around increasing afforestation, timber construction so that you're building uh, new buildings from uh, modern timber construction methods, that's all going extremely well. Restoring peatland is OK. But then when we come to the agricultural measures, we've really struggled. And in Scotland, agriculture about half the emissions in agriculture is from methane, livestock. About a third is from nitrous oxide, which is essentially fertilizer use, and about 10% carbon dioxide, which is machinery on the farms. We have really struggled to persuade farmers, even if it is in their economic benefit, in other words, they'll make money out of it, to change their practices, to move towards a more uh, low carbon, more precise farming technology, which delivers benefits. So there has been a real challenge, uh, and, and I know you'll be talking about that this afternoon. How about next steps? In many respects, what Scotland has done over the last 15 years has been the easy stuff, because actually it hasn't required people to change the way in which they live their lives in any meaningful way. You know, when you plug in a plug or a light in Edinburgh, just as in Dublin, the lights come on. Yeah, you don't need to worry about it. So everything's been hidden. The, the building that has been insulated, you don't really see very much of that. But what the big plans are going forward are much, much more ambitious. So the plans are to say, look, the big challenge in Scotland, and I'm guessing also in, in Ireland, is not actually electricity, which is this, if this is sort of energy demand, this bottom one is electricity. 
Yeah? It's only about 25% of all the energy we use comes from electricity. The big one, which varies massively through the year, is heat. Yeah? It's cold and dark in Scotland in December. Yeah? I wouldn't say it's warm and hot in July, but it's, it's warmer. So the big heat demands come in midwinter. So one of the questions is, how do you manage that heat demand? How do you manage delivering that if we can't use natural gas 10, 20, 30 years' time? So there's a huge effort to try and improve, basically, the quality of buildings across Scotland. So the government has set as a national infrastructure priority to essentially improve every single building across the country <coughs> to raise the quality of the efficiency, the productivity, or the efficiency of the buildings across the country. There's also been a big push to them to try and reduce traditional transport fuels by enabling more electric vehicles, by enabling hydrogen vehicles. So most of the work over the next 10 years, from the government's perspective, is very clear plan to try and enable and encourage the shift into electric vehicles, to hydrogen vehicles, to improve the quality of buildings for businesses, domestic buildings, so that you don't need so much heat energy in the first place. And then we can worry about, after 2030, 2032, we can worry about other more complex things. So the, the, the plans in Scotland are very much to decarbonise the whole system, to think about it as a whole system problem, not as an electricity problem or a heat problem or a transport problem. And then finally, this notion of localising or democratising the energy system. How do you get local communities far more engaged in this system and taking the benefit, the social and the economic <coughs> benefit? But at the heart of all of this is political leadership. Yeah? It was about saying, we may not have all the evidence for delivering all of this. The initial targets, the 42% emission reduction target, what was originally a 50% or even a 40% renewable electricity target by 2020, none of those anybody thought we could achieve. But actually setting the target, creating the enabling infrastructure, has allowed us to overachieve against those time and time again. So political leadership is key. The other thing is that this is, we talk about climate change. Climate change isn't actually talked about. What we're talking about is warm, affordable homes, effective transport systems. Yeah? We're talking about economic and social benefit and having a vision for the country which says, actually, we want to be at the forefront of this but because that's what we, we want to have an effective energy system that works for us, which is affordable, which is clean. Yeah? So it's very much around that vision for the country, not about saving polar bears. It's about saying we can be a great country. Renewables are now cost competitive or becoming increasingly cost competitive. Therefore, you can end up with a fantastic, affordable, clean energy system, which delivers the country's wider goals. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.